This is dull. It's a hamlet in Highland, Perthshire. As you can see, it's twinned with Boring in Oregon, USA. But a young lad who left here in 1808 means it probably has closer association with San Antonio in Texas and the Alamo. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. The Loch Tay area is one of my favourite places in Scotland. Back in the day, it was McGregor country. And I've brought you to a place called Dull, where very little happens to tell you about a boy who started here, but ended as a key player in a siege in an old Spanish mission and fortress in Texas. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. John McGregor was born on the 1st of December 1797 and grew up here in Dull with his dad Thomas and the rest of the family. Now, the fact that he was born a McGregor tells you something about the family in itself. That name had been banned. For 170 years, it had been illegal to hold the name McGregor. A McGregor was banned from carrying out a legal contract, owning livestock or land, carrying the weapons so essential for everyday living, from everything that constituted life at the time. The prescription finally came to an end in 1774. Many had changed their names and never changed back. Now, if your very name has been banned for generations and after 170 years, without knowing the future, you straightway take it back, that says something about the family of Thomas McGregor and their son John. Rebellious, stubborn, loyal, brave. A couple of miles to the west, Here at Drumcarry, the McGregors of Glen Lyon had a famous piping school. They used to send their best pupils every year to the famous McCrimmons in Skye. Apparently, between 1781 to 1813, 17 McGregors competed in the top competitions and 12 won first prize. That's quite a tradition to follow. Now, I can't pretend to know what went through young John McGregor's mind when he took up the pipes. But it wasn't like joining a pipe band today. People still lived who'd fought at Culloden. A piper was there to rally the troops. Right down to the 20th century, pipers led men into battle and struck fear in their enemies with nothing but deafness of fingers and the power of their very breath. When others carried claymore, musket or Lee Enfield rifle, the pipes were a weapon of war. So even a child must know that death in battle was something a piper might always expect. The question is, under what flag? At the start of the 19th century, people were leaving this beautiful place and crossing the Atlantic. Some were pushed by forces that we've covered in other videos. Others were pulled by the lure of opportunity. One way or another, hard conditions in this beautiful landscape must have been part of the decision for both. As a 12-year-old, young John McGregor would have been taking on some of the roles and responsibilities, chores and challenges of life when the family headed west to Oban. They probably stopped off at the Green Welly Shop and timed them on their way to the port from which they sailed across the Atlantic. Like many Highlanders before them, they landed in Prince Edward Island in Charlottetown, what we would now call Canada, over here anyway. There are still a few Gaelic speakers left there today. That was in June 1808. As he grew to manhood, the next few years would have brought challenges and opportunities, hardships and celebrations. Eventually, he would leave this pioneering family to make his own way south. By the time he was an adult, there were big changes going on in the United States. It was expanding and people were heading west. There were also changes going on in the Spanish Americas. In what would become Texas, the Spanish had decided to allow controlled migration so that selected empresarios under license could bring people, settle and develop their land. As a concession, they wouldn't have to convert to Catholicism. 
Now, the only man who was actually granted rights to set up a colony was Moses Austin. And so Moses would lead his people to the promised land. But in true biblical style, Moses died before he got to the promised land. And a revolution replaced Spain with a new state called Mexico. Moses' son, Stephen Austin, continued where his father had intended to go. And yes, Steve Austin. If they had the slightest consideration for biblical analogies in a video 200 years later, then they would have called him Joshua. But they had to name him after the bionic bloody man. Or a wrestler, depending on your demographic. The point is that in the early 1820s, Steve Austin brought in Anglos from the United States to establish a colony in the East Texas part of Mexico. Now, financial difficulties in the US sparked in 1819 meant that the floodgates to economic migrants opened and through them poured English-speaking Americans. Now, I say Americans, but at least one of them was a Scotsman who'd been born in Dull in North Perthshire. The point is that these Anglos came with all their Northern European ways. Look, it doesn't matter what I call them, I'm still going to have to make air quotes at the end. The fact is that they were a ragtag group of legal immigrants, illegal immigrants, opportunists and ne'er-do-wells. And the Mexicans now wish that they'd built a wall. There were a number of problems. At the end of the 1820s, the Mexican government banned slavery, and a lot of these migrants had brought slaves. They wanted to keep them as slaves, although some of them converted to indentured servants. Now, the new Mexican government backtracked on the idea that these migrants could be non-Catholics. And let's face it, nobody wants rosary beads shoved down their throats. Although I did hear of a kinky priest who... It doesn't matter. The Mexicans also moved from a federal to a more centralised system and insisted that the new colonists spoke Spanish, owned property, had a craft and report to the Mexican authorities for permission to settle. But frankly, it was too late. Now I don't know if he was one of the official entrants or one of the squatters, but it seems that it was as part of this influx John McGregor settled himself as a single man in Burnett's colony in East Texas, just northwest of Nacogdoches. Nacogdoches. Nacogdoches? Nacho Goddess! Nacho. Nacho Doche! Look, what I'm trying to say is he settled near the first town ever established in Texas. And he wasn't married. Anyway. Before long, for some of the reasons that I've mentioned, and I'm sure some others that I haven't, tensions built between a centralising Mexican government and a non-conforming group of settlers. The Mexican government thought, better safe than sorry, and sent troops to recover a cannon that had been left at a place called Gonzales. Little did they suspect that the cannon would turn into a tinderbox. The Americans, Anglos, North European, there do well colonists, settlers. Nobody knew what to call the people who converged in the town to stop the troops taking the cannon, but the Battle of Gonzales is what started the Texan Revolution. Rebellion. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. It was a tomato. Mexican President Santa Ana sent troops from the south towards San Antonio de Bejar. San Antonio to you and me. The colonists in growing numbers headed there from the east and with them went John McGregor of Dull. And as Texas donned Autumn's cloak in 1835, a siege began that saw the Mexican troops fall back to San Antonio de Valera mission. You'll know it as the Alamo. Mexicans on the inside, Texians on the outside. Now, Long story short, eventually the Mexicans surrendered, the colonists occupied the mission, and then most of them drifted off home. Because that was the end of the Texas Tomato Rebellion. Oh, apart from the fact that President Santa Ana was really pissed off and sent an army north to deal with these rebels. He declared them pirates. There would be no quarter. 
When Mexican forces came back to the Alamo, the tables were turned. Mexicans on the outside and on the inside, a set of defenders far more determined than Mexican conscripts. The story of the Alamo siege has been covered in many different places and it's not really one for this channel. It's enough to know that in the small group of 200 men that stood against two to 5,000, Richard Ballantyne, Isaac Robinson, David Wilson and Alamo John McGregor were native-born Scots. Officially, John McGregor was second sergeant in the artillery company. But that's not why he's called Alamo John McGregor. It's because the boy who learned the pipes at Drumcarry was now a man. It's said that McGregor played the pipes and Davy Crockett played the fiddle to entertain the men of Alamo. But it must have been more than that. You see, in addition to the four native-born Scots, many more in the group would have been descended from Scots or Irish. And as they made a desperate, impossible stand, a piper would be more than entertainment. Its very breath through noble laden drone made a man stand taller, stronger, more fearsome than he could on his own. From the time he took up the pipes as a boy in Dull, John McGregor must have known that there was a good chance that he would wield them and through them may well breathe his last in battle. The only question was, under which flag? No quarter was given. And on the 6th of March, 1836, the deaths of John McGregor and every other defender inspired many more to take their place and a month later, when Santa Ana fell at the Battle of San Jacinto, the cry was, remember the Alamo. In 2010, a plaque of Caithness stone was erected at that memorial, museum and shrine in San Antonio. It reads, from the people of Scotland, in memory of the four native Scots and many other defenders of Scots ancestry who gave their lives at the Alamo on March the 6th, 1836. They tell me that Scots are the only nation remembered there in that way. And John McGregor from Highland Perthshire, whose very name was banned, whose family reclaimed that title monarchs tried to obliterate, ensured the name McGregor would live forever, at least in Texas. If you want to know what led to the prescription of the McGregor name in the first place, there's a video coming up on screen now. You should watch it. In the meantime, Hamian Dawkins can be a lamb alive. Cheerio and Rasta.